Exactly. Behind the scenes, CISC might internally in implementation will be breaking that down into small, small steps, but it provided a complex interface to the I user. I understood. One instruction. While risk says is rather than me breaking a big instruction down, I will give you all the small instruction and you break your complex, uh, complex operation into those small. I see. So the creativity of breaking that complex operation into sub steps stays yes. with the software programmer. Yes, exactly. So it is up to the compiler to come up with innovative okay. ways to optimize the complex operations. Right. Huh. So Rajat, let, let's do this. You know, why don't you walk us through the ARM architecture and let's cover the history, you know, ARM families and specifically then, you know, towards the end, focus on the M class controllers. How about that? Yeah. So talking about ARM, I think ARM has been a very influential architecture in today's era. No okay. matter which electronics you see around you, there's there, there's a good chance there's an ARM processor sitting over there. It mm -hmm. has been the pinnacle for the smartphone industry. Uh, it uh, has been there in all your small devices like vacuum cleaners, uh, trimmers, etc. And so, uh, with the emergence of Apple M1 and Qualcomm X8, I think soon we will have ARM architectures running on our laptops as well. So today we will look into a bit of history about ARM, how ARM started, and what differentiated ARM from rest of the uh, processes, and wh why ARM became so popular. And then we will look into different ARM families that we have today. Mm -hmm. And then we will have a small introduction to the Cortex M family and why Cortex M family is so important. Right. So maybe okay. uh, when you were mentioning about the ARM family of controllers being available all around us, like almost omnipresent. Um, yes. You were referring mostly to the M class family. Oh no, it's not only M class okay. family, right? For okay. example, if you if you take your uh, smartphones, mm -hmm. there's a good chance there's a um, uh, there's a ARM A processor sitting over there. Right. Okay. So uh, if you take your cars, there's a good chance there's a Cortex R running over there. Right. Uh, in so cars. it's almost even though your laptop's main processor is a uh, you know, Intel based mostly, mm -hmm. but you will still find ARM processor maybe as part of modem, as part of Wi-Fi controller, as part of Bluetooth. So even your laptops have small, small ARM processor all around there. Right, right. So it's not only the smartphone, it's uh, almost everywhere you can find an ARM processor. Right. But then most popular family is the M. Popular meaning most prevalent. Okay. Yes. Uh, if you talk about quantity wise, yes. Uh, most quantity yeah. wise selling uh, is Cortex. Okay. Okay. And well, I was kind of slowly, well, I was asking that question to nudge the fact that, you know, why we have chosen M and that's because it's really very, yeah. very popular. Okay. Perfect. So moving on then, let's talk about the yeah. history. So ARM actually started with Econ Systems. So Econ Systems was a British company and they used to make computers mm -hmm. and they wanted to make a small computer uh, that can be accessible to everyone. Mm -hmm. And the processors at that time, they, they didn't uh, fit their uh, requirements. So they wanted to create a new processor. So who's, who's that can required? be used in BB Micro. Oh. It was uh, Econ Systems. So they wanted to make BB Micro. A okay. uh, small computer that can be accessible to all. Okay. And so they uh, so they collaborated with a couple of processor uh, professors and uh, wanted to uh, develop a new uh, processor that can be used that is powerful yet very power efficient. Okay. So this was at the time where performance and power efficiency were two different directions, and no people were not majorly focusing on power efficiency. Mm -hmm. They were majorly focusing on performance. Mm -hmm. That is the x86. I see. A CISC based architecture. Okay. And then can, can you and wait, just moment. Up, so can you talk yes. about the CISC and RISC once again, just so that you know the viewers are on board? Yeah. So CISC and RISC are two different methodologies of design uh, designing a ISA, mm -hmm. the instruction set architecture of a processor. Mm -hmm. So instruction set architecture is like a agreement between the software and the processor. Right. So it tells that if software respects X, Y, Z instructions, the ABC operations will be done by the processors hmm. and irrespective of how you write the software, as long as you uh, respect this contract, hmm. everything is, everything will work. 
irrespective if they change the hardware implementation okay. as well. Okay. So it is uh, a methodology, CISC and RISC are methodology how that ISA should be written and we will cover CISC and RISC in upcoming okay. slides in okay. more details. Okay. Go ahead then. So we were yeah. talking about so, power efficient and performant processors, the search for that. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, uh, so based on this ARM1 and ARM2 were designed by Steve Ferber and Sophie Wilson, but uh, they were not quite well used. The first success for ARM came uh, when ARM was formed in 1990 as a joint venture between Acorn and Apple. So Apple wanted to do a Newton processor for their uh, uh, for their ma uh, computer systems. Mm -hmm. So they decided to go with Acorn because they liked the architecture of ARM mm -hmm. and how power efficient it was. Mm -hmm. And that's where the a separate company was formed called Arm Limited. I see. So the Arm Limited so, here and the Arm that we are talking about here are two different names. Yes. Uh, yes. So uh, the first Arm actually used to refer to a con risk machine. Mm -hmm. And when Arm Limited was formed, its name was changed to Advanced Risk Machine. Right. And then here we are talking about advanced advanced risk machines risk machines okay so uh, a bit of highlight here is i arm was not the first company to do risk based mm -hmm. machines risk was already in research mm -hmm. uh, so there was a popular architecture called mips mm -hmm. and spark which were also risk based processors mm -hmm. that came out of a partnership between ibm stanford and berkeley right, right. And the met the terminology risk actually uh, it's David yes, Peterson David, yeah. who came up with the terminology of uh, risk right. processes while his work at Berkeley. Right. right. You know, at this point, I'll just add yes. a, a line here because we are now talking about you know David Patterson and John Hennessy who worked close together and yeah. came up with the risk or rather proposed or you know kind of uh, pro uh, yeah they pretty much proposed that you know. Um, a, a more convoluted operation can be done as smaller operations back to back. Uh, and yes. we'll talk about this once we are on the risk and CISC slide. Uh, slide. Yeah. Uh, but let's let's go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So MIPS and Spark. Yeah. So uh, the... MIPS and Spark were the pre-existing risk architectures. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, so, uh, but the Apple Newton was not that successful uh, of a project. Okay. It didn't gain much. Okay. Uh, the real success came in when Nokia decided to use ARM based TI, ARM based TI designs for their mobile systems. Mm -hmm. So this was the time where people were start slowly moving towards mobile system and mobile system was supposed to see a growth mm -hmm. where people saw an opportunity where smartphones and phones can uh, mm -hmm. evolve. So this was GSM based design and TI convinced Nokia to use an ARM based processor mm -hmm. for it. I see. I see. And this was the start where everything boomed mm -hmm. up. And ARM 7 TDMI, mm. so the main, the processor that was used was the ARM 7 TDMI and it became the baseline processor for almost every smartphone at that time. Mm. Right. And from there, the ARM processors boomed up and somewhere in 2005, so the problem that came is now everybody wanted to use ARM, but there were different areas they want to use mm. it. Mm. But and they didn't fit all those areas. For example, if you want to use this in small microcontrollers, mm. the seven, ARM 7 design was a quite big design for I that. I see. Okay. But they cannot sell the same ARMs. But if they bring it to a low performance, they cannot then sell the same design to a high-end processor for smartphone. I see. So this was the time where ARM decided to separate themselves and form three different families, mm. namely Cortex-A, Cortex-R, and Cortex-M. Right. More famously, again, ARM. Right. Right. So, A was the performance course, which were majorly used for smartphones, etc. Mm. R was the real time course, which were used uh, for functional safety, motor control, etc. Mm. And M were the little course that were used for very small applications that just need some kind of real time mm. response. Mm. Right. So, these are like the least complex one, these are like a little more complex and these are like the most complex one in terms of their design yes. and functionality. In terms of yeah. design. Okay. So, should we move on to the next slide then? Okay, yes. Let's go here. Yeah. So, 
what differentiated arm from the processors that were available at that time for uh, smartphones etc right so the differentiating factor was the risk methodology where most of the processors that were meant for performance at that mm-hmm. time were x86 based mm-hmm. and risk was still a, you know more of a research mm-hmm. project than a actual project right. and so majorly it was the risk based but arm was like Cisc doesn't was not uh, suiting their uh, Acon was not uh, Acon professors the professors who were working with Acon thought Cisc is not the right architecture mm-hmm. for them so they wanted to experiment with the risk processors reduced instruction set processors right. and so what is risk when we say reduced instruction set computers this actually doesn't mean that the number of instructions are reduced okay okay what this means is the complexity of the instruction is reduced okay. so when we talk about complex inter- instruction set architecture they are well known to do multiple operations in a single instruction right. and we'll take a look at the example in next slide over okay. there how risk and cisc are different in their thought okay. process while what the reduced instruction set says is we should not do such complex operations multiple steps uh, which include multiple steps in a single instruction mm-hmm. rather divide each step as a instruction of its own right right so on the behind risk and cisc may look very well same underneath it's the interface where cisc says you know you have a very complex operation exposed to you you can use this underneath cisc can uh, divide this that complex operation into a very small small steps you mean risk and risk cisc i see okay so cisc says i'll give you one operation and behind the scene it can break it down exactly exactly behind the scene cisc might internally in implementation will be breaking that down into small small steps but it provided a complex interface to the I user i understood one instruction while risc says is rather than me breaking a big instruction down i will give you all the small instruction and you break your complex a uh, complex operation into those small i see so the creativity of breaking that complex operation into sub steps stays yes. with the software programmer yes exactly so it is up to the compiler to come up with innovative okay. ways to optimize the complex operations right right so let me put it this way then in cisc we have an instruction for example right and then the hardware yeah. hardware will break the complexity break down yes uh the complexity yes right and what you're saying now is in risk uh, the instruction might be you know st- still the same or multiple same instruction part. yeah but the hardware uh will not well the uh, okay let me put it this way so it's the programmer the compiler or, yes okay or the compiler in this case yeah so that breaks down uh yes the complexity okay yes i think this is a good way to distinguish between cisc and risc who does the most okay. work so ultimately it goes back into the same hardware software trade off mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. so cisc said that uh, i will trade off on a big ha- on a hardware mm-hmm. because at that time softwares were not that very powerful mm-hmm. makes sense because you didn't have very powerful systems to run that powerful software while sis said is i would let the software decide and uh, break down the complexity and all those optimizations mm. and i will just do a very simple operation makes sense makes sense so let's then put it this way in risk a hardware is simple yes right and compiler uh, that deals with the complexity yes okay okay uh, let's go ahead yeah so what happens over here is since i don't have a very complex instruction to decode mm. the hardware decoder paths become very simple mm. Mm. makes sense yeah because now hardware decoder path doesn't have to break a very complex in- instruction into a very simple simple small small steps that the al you can process right right then because of that would it be fair to say that this also then leads to low power usage e- kind of kind of okay maybe 
Yeah. Maybe. Kind of. <laughs> Not sure yet. So uh, there's a lot of things that go into low power. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, I was, than, I was uh, just saying a risk. For sure. This. So I was kind of comparing risk to a CISC machine. So compared yeah. to CISC machine, would a risk machine, you know, of the same, let's say, instruction set, would it consume less power? Or maybe we'll comment on that later. We will comment. I, I'm not, a, you know, I will not say I am a VLSI professional right. to come yeah. completely, and I don't want. Uh, a VLSI professional to come and question me that how can you say that? Sure. <laughs> but, you know, again, it goes back to the hardware design and architecture, mm. how the design. But yes, if I, if you talk about raw gate counts, etc., you need more logic to implement a hardware right. decode, right. the instruction decode for CISC than for RISC. Right. I think I was just thinking of exactly that. Maybe the energy spent in decoding yeah. would be less. But we cannot comment yes. about, you know, um, the architecture itself. Yes, because, Influence. Yes, because uh, now you are, uh, because there's another point over there, right? Uh, even though the energy spent on decoding is more on CIS, it is able to decode much more steps. Exactly, at once, exactly. Right? Yes, yes. So it is not per instruction. So doing it per instruction energy consumption is not fair true. because CISC is actually doing more stuff in one instruction yeah. than RISC does. Yeah, true, true. I think I agree. Uh, just based on the in uh, what do you say the method methodology we cannot straight up comment on whether it would be low power yeah. or not okay fair yes so but what risk makes easy is that it simplifies the hardware right. design right fair since hardware doesn't now doesn't have to do hardware work uh, extra work mm-hmm. over there it can simple it has to do very simple instructions which can be decoded and operated on alu fast right fair fair so it becomes easier to design a very high depth pipeline stages, etc. Mm. So it becomes it makes hardware design easy. Is right. what can we can give comment some right. examples right. of risk. So far, so yes. good. Like okay. Then moving how it is on. broken okay. down in risk, the complex architecture. Yeah. So yeah. So this example precisely does that. So if let's say we have to add two variables stored at memory location 1800 and 1804 and store them back at 1800 location, CISC will typically have a single instruction to do that. Wait, wait, wait. Could, could, it can take memory. I think I missed that. Could you repeat the example you were saying? So let's say I want to, let's, uh, let's say there's a variable stored at location 1800 okay. and another variable stored at location 1804. Okay. And what I want is to add these two variables and store their result back into 1800 location. Ah, okay. So you want to update this with A plus B. All right, let's go. Yeah. Yes. Hmm. So A basically A is equal to A plus B. Hmm. Such hmm. kind of instruction. So and uh, let's not take it theoretically correct instruction. It may not be correct, but I'm just giving an example. What does this instruction might look like? Hmm. Is it can have a single instruction over here where it can directly address the memory. Maybe on the back, it is not directly addressing the memory. It is loading it into some register, doing it and loading back. But to the user, it looks like a single instruction fair. where they can do a memory addressing fair, directly. Fair, fair, fair. While on the risk side, this will translate into four instructions, which will be two loads, one add and one store. And that's where the popular name for risk comes as load store architecture. Mm. Because you cannot directly address the memory. You need to first bring a variable into the regi- general purpose registers operate on general purpose registers and then store them back. Mm. And that's a perfect example of breaking a complex operation into a smaller operations, the risk versus risk methodology. Right. So uh, let me maybe, you know, first off, you know, Vasim, does it answer your yeah, question? Yes, I'm convinced. Of the example, are you convinced with this? Okay. Okay. So I'm imagining that this is like the actual line in code, for example. Yes. Right. But then on a risk, uh, for a risk machine, it would split somewhat like this into load and store operation, load, compute and store operation. And here it would be just like compute. However, like yeah. through memory directly, you know, get the memory content to mm-hmm. ALU and pass it back to, um, okay, uh, pass it back to the memory. But then the other thing I'm imagining is that this, um, Okay, this complexity again is handled by the hardware, but here this was generated by the compiler. Yes. Okay. So this breakdown of 
you know, actions into simpler action, that was compiler's job. Fail. Okay. Yes. I mean, the compiler also did the same thing here, but uh, it had an add instruction. So it knew that, you know, this addition yeah. can be converted to this instruction. But here the add is converted to this instruction, yes. But also it needs to infer that something needs to be loaded and stored. So that start yeah. smartness needs yeah. to be with the compiler. Okay. Yes. So, uh, so that's a, a classic example of risk versus CISC. Hmm. And so what happened over time is compilers became smart enough to do very good optimizations mm -hmm. and the, co uh, the code uh, optimized by compilers became much more efficient. And that's where we are seeing nowadays a gap between CISC versus RISC I in see. terms of power. I see. So because RISC is doing a small, small number of operations when compared to RISC. Understood. Understood. So it's actually the com evolution in compiler design. Uh, exactly. That has led to risk becoming more and more capable. Right. Yes. Okay. So uh, I like to compare it exactly like AI ML. If you look at AI ML, a lot of algorithms of AI ML were the mathematical work of AI ML was done in 70s and 80s. Mm. But it was not very recently in 2015 when people started uh, seeing the benefits of AI ML because the computation became much uh, faster. Yeah. So even though compilers had a compilers mathematical work was there, the compilers were not that powerful to run such kind of optimizations. Mm -hmm. And those continuous algorithmic improvements on optimization ha is what is uh, bridging the gap between risk and CISC mm -hmm. now. To the point that somewhere, you know, the benefits of CISC are outdoing risk, at least for general compute purposes. And that's where I suppose uh, Apple moved to the M1 chip. And yes. the M1 chip, well, having personally used it, uh, the fan just never turns on, <laughs> uh, right? At least in my case, for the use cases that I, uh, you know, have. But uh, Intel yeah. PCs, you know, the fan's always on, like pretty much. Uh, again, you know, it it not yeah. it's not just so, uh, Intel; yeah. it's also AMD. So the idea being that the CISC machine kind of heats up. Yeah. yeah. So, go ahead. So a lot of that has to do with different factors and not just only risk processes, processes. but let's not go into yes. those details. For another video. Yeah. yeah, let's, yeah, let that's for another Okay, video. then let's move on to the ARM family of processors. I think you touched yeah. upon those, so, let's go, yeah. Yeah, so ARM finally decided that a single family cannot address the market uh, they are seeing, the growth market that they are mm -hmm. seeing. So that's why in 2005, they decided to separate uh, their ARM designs into three broad families, mm -hmm. Cortex-A, Cortex-R, and Cortex-M. Given today, there are much more families than this. There's a Newverse family, which is for server grade. There's a Cortex-X family, which is a custom, which is a much more power, which is just Cortex-A on steroids. Okay, okay. Which is the same base design of Cortex-A, but, but much more powerful. Mm -hmm. And are these used for uh, cloud? Smartphones. These are? Uh, so Cortex-X, those, these are there in your, so nowadays, most of these smartphones, big core is a Cortex X based core. I see. Okay. Okay. Fair, fair. Okay. Yeah. So there's not much architectural difference between Cortex N and Cortex A. Mm. So they are, they rely on the same uh, base ISA, which is ARM V9. Mm -hmm. They are just a bit of segregation, like having high, huge crash size, etc. More pipeline understood, stages. Understood. Fair, fair, fair. Yeah. Mm. So if you look at uh, the performance perspective, right? So the performance actually increases from Cortex M to Cortex A. Right. Within the same class of families. Mm -hmm. So uh, you should not compare that. I should, I will compare ARM V6A uh, with ARM V8A. There's a good chance there's ARM V8M I processor see. that outruns ARM V6R processor. Understood. So what you're, what you're saying actually is if we, we are to compare performance, then for the same architecture yeah. version, the yes. Cortex A family would outdo the Cortex M family, right? Yeah. So basically, we should understand. Not uh, we should not come go into the raw numbers. It is the design methodology. Mm -hmm. So Cortex A's were always designed with performance in mind because they are supposed to run high level operating systems like Linux, etc. Mm -hmm. And uh, Cortex R's are like a middle ground between Cortex M's and Cortex A's, where you still have 
a bit of real time response mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. along with a bit more power than cortex m mm. fair so i will i can tell you for example cortex m7 beats cortex r in raw numbers uh wait cortex <laughs> m m7 oh wait not mv7 you're saying m7 beats can uh, can beat cortex r4 in raw numbers i see okay okay so but they are not the same kind right I see. so similar so that doesn't generalize for example r5 will be more powerful for, for m7 so whenever they come up with a design of a processor so they they have different trade offs mm-hmm. to match to mm-hmm. so the performance is the typical graph of performance is cortex r is more powerful than cortex m mm-hmm. cortex a is more powerful than cortex r right right why the reverse happens for in case of power and cost hmm. the power consumption of cortex a is more than cortex r the power consumption of cortex r is more than cortex right, m right. and the same co- goes for cost right. so cortex m's are the cheapest designs that you can license from mm-hmm. arm while cortex r's are a bit expensive and cortex a, a are the expensive mm-hmm. ones right and you know i see that you have listed here that that is primarily because low gate count and count and exactly. less complexity fair yes so cortex m in terms of gate count is less mm-hmm. than cortex r so that's where the cost comes in right. and it, this is not only the cost licensing cost from arm this is the manufacturing cost, cost as well okay. how much it costs you to manufacture mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. device makes sense makes sense so if you look at the typical use cases the cortex m is most typically used used in you know very interrupt sensitive areas mm-hmm. you know it's mostly used where you want to take two signals do some calculation route some third signal mm-hmm. out mm-hmm. you want a very deterministic behavior yeah kind of where you only want to implement state machines exactly and maybe very less uh, simple state machines simple state machines and in case of an r it would be like you need determinism yes uh determinism in your so in your state machines and let me just put it this way a is when you don't care about <laughs> latencies and everything it's yeah. like just run my application so r r is most pro- so r mm-hmm. is like you need determinism is there but you the so the most deterministic is cortex m r is like okay i will trade off determinism a bit mm-hmm. for performance right but when we say performance wouldn't determinism be part of that or uh, not actually so determinism uh, also relies on your interrupt latency how fast you are able to respond to devices correct and you're saying in case of r the interrupt latency is better or worse so yes because in m you have vectored interrupt so you have multiple yeah. uh, Uh, multiple uh, intra so the time in which the interrupt will be addressed is kind of fixed mm-hmm. and it is hardware guaranteed mm-hmm. while cortex r it has the interrupt mechanism of cortex a that means it doesn't comes with its own vector interrupt mm-hmm. every vendor implements its own vector interrupt for i see understood understood so uh, this is kind of based on something called the trap mechanism would you say yes okay. exactly let let me also you know spell out what vectored and trap interrupt mechanism mean so let's say there is a cpu and there is like an interrupt line right and let's say you know there is like another unit here from which you get to know which number interrupt number has occurred now if your cpu changes or you know jumps to a function or a code by looking up in a table directly in hardware you know let's say for 31 it has abc and then the program counter changes to abc uh abc right so this would be vectored in the sense that you have a table uh that you have to pre populate and the cpu is able to just look up directly in hardware the 31st entry in this case and set the program counter to abc so this would be vectored right and if your cpu after an interrupt comes uh if it goes and looks up in software meaning you have to write some code here you have to write some code here as well and in between there is like a software based lookup uh then what will happen is every interrupt is routed to the same code 
and that code internally figures out what interrupt number has happened and then you know calls another function right. or another code so this we call trap right. wherein any interrupt incoming goes to the same code and the code dispatches or decides which function to call so this is trap mechanism yep. which r class uses and a class also uses trap mechanism actually a mix of both trap and uh, yep. in vector and yes it's a trap and vectored mm -hmm. Uh, because some uh, some other hardware. So the only difference is Cortex M implements its own vectored uh, handler interrupt handler right, right. IP within the Cortex M. There is a MVIC which sits right within the Cortex M itself. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not true for Cortex R and Cortex A. Mm -hmm. Right. Understood. Uh, so in so this gives a very deterministic interrupt latency. Understood. Okay. Fair. Fair. <laughs> right. So I'm thinking R is like a trade-off where your application is a little heavy and you can't run it on M. Yes. Uh, okay. So you need a yes. little more you know, compute power than M and yes, you are trading off like the reactiveness essentially. Yes. Fair, fair. Uh, cool. But it's still not as lousy as Cortex A. Of course. Of course. So there are not elements like uh, memory management unit. The virtual addressing concept is not there in Cortex R which are going to add extra latencies in between. Hmm, understood, understood. So those are missing in Cortex R. Okay, perfect. Uh, should we move on to the next okay. slide then? Okay, oh, wait. I think this is uh, yes. what you were hinting at. Go ahead. Yeah. So Cortex R, uh, Cortex M within itself has multiple uh, designs and that is also again done, done based, majorly based on power, perform power mm -hmm. performance and cost. Oh. So when you go outside in the in this kind of market, right, where mm -hmm. Cortex M suits in, there's no single device that fits mm -hmm. all of them, right? So for example, if you take a trimmer, the trimmer might not need a very extensive uh, power, right. computation power. Right. Or uh, if you okay. look at, uh, you know, automated okay, uh, uh, lighting that has to just connect to Wi-Fi and turn on a light. So you don't need much processing power over there, but you still need the effectiveness over mm. there and the low power because these devices and, has to run on right, battery right. for long. But Bluetooth is right. a good example so wherever, of Bluetooth right. is a good example of it, right? So wherever you need very basic data processing mm -hmm. and IO, that's where Cortex M0, M0 Plus and M23 okay. come in picture. These are very low power count, uh, low gate count and very mm -hmm. low power devices that can do very right. basic operations. Right. And let's say now you want to do some additional data processing. Let's say you wanted to do some floating point unit or some, some, uh, some extra power. That's where Cortex M3 right. comes into picture. Right. A bit of note Cortex M3 is not recommended okay. for designs. Most of the new designs are based on much powerful okay. Cortex M4, which introduced some of the DSP instructions along with Cortex M3. So it's Cortex M3 plus an additional I DSP I instructions. ALU I and when you're for saying DSP. DSP, what I'm able to think of it, uh, think of is you have a register mm -hmm. with, you know, some big number in it, but you say, you know, a, let's say you have 32 bit um uh, data and you say okay yeah. what i'm going to do is take eight bits at a time and i want it to be multiplied with other registers content but eight bits yes. you know as chunks and so that is the idea of yeah. uh simd like single instruction but then you single instruction add, and add the data. parts of uh, the register and by the way this comes up in dsp uh, specifically in matrix multiplication yeah. when you're doing matrix multiplication right you have like a row with entries yeah. uh, sorry a column with entries and then multiple rows like so actually let me draw accurate picture so you have different rows with numbers right and you might have a vector a column vector here and you want to individually you know do like a dot product something like that Okay, cool. So yeah. uh, M4, M7, and M3, uh, 33 are for those uh, reasons. Right. Uh, I will also want to, you know, spend some time on these numberings, right? So the idea here is that there is something called architecture. 
uh, just a moment let me spell this right my brain doesn't work right so there is something called architecture which is just like a textual description of what the processor should do and then there is an implementation right which is called the micro architecture so these here might implement the same architecture for m uh, meaning that the description is followed but the implementation varies so this might have like more pipelines than this uh, this might you know do add a little bit faster than this guy does and so on and so forth so these are different implementations of the m architecture right that is what uh, yes uh, essentially these numbers are suggesting different variants or different implementations yeah yeah and more recently arm has added uh, new families with the emergence of ai and the edge computing becoming more and more mm -hmm. uh, promising uh, arm decided to add uh, something what they call a helium core which is a mm -hmm. ai accelerator more like a matrix multiplication okay. accelerator and that's where uh, uh, we came we got new devices which is m85 and m55 which are more like uh, m30 m55 is more like m33 with the helium mm -hmm. accelerator in it and and m85 is more like uh, m7 with the helium accelerator I and see, processor so so let's spend a bit of time over here uh, so the devices that mm -hmm. you see in green comes up with something mm -hmm. called Prozone. And what Prozone is, Prozone is basically segregating your data, uh, your uh, code mm -hmm. into two portions, secure and non-secure okay. areas. It's basically a separation, a logical mm -hmm. separation of memory. So maybe, you know, right. Let, let you me draw a diagram so that, you know, people can follow along. So you yeah. have your CPU yeah. here. Then you have, you know, some interconnect. Interconnect is just essentially, you know, a bridge between the CPU and, for example, let's say the memory. Right. And let's say you have two types of memories, memory one and memory two. Now, mm. the idea of trust zone is that you can have two types of code running on the CPU. Only one of them runs at a time. But one of them is called non-secure and the other one is called secure secure is like more trusted the the let's say the yeah. vendor code runs in secure and the user code runs in non-secure for example the idea then is the non-secure code can give a call to the secure code and then in hardware you know when the transaction is being sent an extra line is being floated saying it's a trust zone transaction and what can happen yeah. is when the processor is booting up, you can segregate your address space into non-secure and secure. Uh, and what that means is yes. that a non-secure code will never be able to reach to a secure marked address. And only the secure yes. uh, code can reach. And when the CPU is executing the secure yes. code, it will actually shift or change the state in hardware to float this extra line or to set this extra line, uh, TZ yes. bit, we call it, uh, which kind of indicates to the interconnect that it should pass the address. And it also indicates to the destination that it should respond back properly to that transaction. So that's the idea of trust zone. Okay, go ahead. Do you want to add more to this? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so it's just a logical separation of the core. It's not like they have put a redundant mm. hardware over there. It's just there is some additional hardware to mm. segregate the states mm. of the CPU and to route some extra right. signal downstream. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and I, I would just add, uh, like to add a bit of motivation why PY uh, Arm mm -hmm. decided to do that. So earlier when people wanted to segregate there was no other way rather than to separate their code and put it All on right. two so different processors. Right, so you had two separate processors. One was the secure, one was the non-secure. And then you yeah. also had like memories like this, right? M1 and M2. And then there would be yeah. like some hardware mechanism where this guy, this CPU kind of in hardware kind of passes a message 
somehow communicates to the other guy to do something exactly right. and they, they exactly so rather so to save the hardware cost is when exactly. this trust zone right. came in uh though people have again went back to separating a separate core completely for yeah. security no, i think <laughs> that's a right. different uh, point that's quite advanced true, let's true. not go I over there i think as the use cases <laughs> become more and more complex yeah. people just decided to again have like a separate yeah. uh, cpu fair uh, like an isolated island yes. so to speak as it was but there are lots of applications island. where having yeah. so for example you know let's consider this when this non secure code is executing this processor can go to sleep right in certain cases right yes. actually in most of the cases and then when this guy is executing the um, process this guy can go to sleep and i suppose that is what gets solved if you plug yes. both of them together as one processor right and okay then yeah. these processors here provide this you know for secure and non secure optional impl- optional of, implementation right. of trust zone. they may may not have it but they do provide an op- option that you know trust zone can be present but in yeah. these cases the blue cases there is no chance yeah perfect yes. okay cool i think with this then we okay. can conclude so, is are there any final remarks you would want to make or yeah. we're good to conclude no i i guess this is good enough for a very right. basic introduction maybe you know Hmm. to our can... <laughs> we are, obviously in future sessions we'll go into much more depth of a cortex sure. m4 based processor and we'll look into its architecture and how it does multiple right. things but and definitely we will do something on yes. cortex yes. a as well do something similar time. about cortex a as well yeah perfect all right i think yeah. with this then we'll okay. close I... the call for today and uh, thanks for hanging around for those of yes. you who are still here <laughs> Bye bye see you yeah. next time okay yeah.